This is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He who believes on him is not condemned, but he who believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height or depth, nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. Before we begin our study this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're so thankful we can be here today. Your word is such a comfort. It is a source of strength for us because it is truth, because it is your mind, it is your thinking, and it reveals to us who you are, who we are, and how we are to live in conformity and consistent with your creation. Father, as we begin a new study this morning and we begin a new series We look forward to what we will learn about your plan and your purposes for the human race and for us individually, that we might learn to live for you and not for ourselves. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Dispensationalism. Now that doesn't sound like a user-friendly word. It's not a term that we can intuit its meaning. Neither can we be too successful at understanding its significance through the normal lexical analysis. If you look at the word dispensationalism, does it have something to do with dispensing? Yes, it does, but you're probably not going to come up with it just by analyzing the word. Uh, Does it have to do with uh, a dispensation, sort of a get-out-of-jail-free card, so to speak, when you hear it used in a phrase like a papal dispensation? So what exactly is this word dispensationalism? As a result of the fact that this is a little bit of an antiquity in terms of, uh, of the word, an antiquated usage, For many Christians, its meaning remains rather opaque. When they hear the word, their brain fogs over. Nevertheless, for hundreds of thousands of these same Christians, they have been exposed through popular literature, books such as Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth, fictional works such as the Left Behind series by Tim LaHaye, and by numerous sermons and Bible studies uh, conducted where the pastors or the Bible teachers never use any form of technical vocabulary, yet they still teach the basic principles of dispensationalism. I remember a conversation I had with a family friend uh, some 10 years ago where I used the term dispensationalism, and she looked at me as if I had just lost my head. This was a woman who should have known better. She had a couple of brothers who were missionaries in a major conservative denomination. She had spent her life growing up in church and had been in all kinds of Bible studies. And yet the term dispensationalism was as foreign to her as Uh, any other deep theological term. So the term itself seems a little off-putting for some people, so we need to somehow try to uh, unscrew the inscrutable in this series. Millions of Bible students over the last 200 years have had their soul enlightened through the discovery of dispensational truth. For many of them, the apparently murky message of the Bible suddenly cleared as they learned to interpret the Bible in a consistent, literal, 
manner, a manner consistent with the plain, normal use of language, which is really the foundation of dispensational truth. So this morning, in light of the fact that we're about to begin our annual Bible conference for Chafer Seminary, I want to do two things with this message. The first is to provide an introduction to what we will learn during the coming few days in our conference related to dispensationalism. And second, this is the introduction to the new series that we're going to continue on Tuesday nights now that we have finished our Acts series this last week. So uh, following this week, we will be in this series on Tuesday nights. It is something of a redo of a series that I taught back in 2000 when I was at Preston City Bible Church, but as with many of the series I taught there that are available now only in audio format, this needs to be in a visual format because, as many of you know, because you have learned dispensational charts since you were uh, knee-high to a grasshopper, um, this is a visual-based series. It's helpful to have visuals and charts in order to work our way through an understanding of dispensations. Also, over the past uh, 14 years, I've learned a thing or two more than when I taught this 14 years ago. There's a lot that goes on, but this is still going to be a basic Series. I'm not going to get into a lot of the uh, more advanced issues related to dispensationalism. It's something that we all need to understand a little more clearly as to why we believe what we believe. And so this morning, by way of introduction, I want to begin by addressing the question, dispensationalism, why should I care? What is the significance of dispensationalism? And why is it important to my spiritual life? To begin, we need to at least have a basic working definition so that for those of you who may be unfamiliar with this term, you can at least have some concept of what we're talking about as we work our way through through this message. We will come back in the next message and drill down a little bit on uh, the term dispensationalism. If you've been brought up on a modern translation, you will look in vain for this word in your concordance because it's usually been replaced in the more modern translations from the New American Standard to New International Version with the phrase administration, which is a, an, also an accurate uh, translation of the uh, of the Greek, but the old King James version used the term dispensation accurately, and so that term is usually linked to a little more antiquated translation of the Bible, though it's one we we all grew, many of us grew up on and love. But terms like that no longer exist in our Bible, so we need to figure out what this means. We'll get into that. Uh, in the next lesson. So for a brief working definition, dispensationalism is a theological system. Now I'm going to explain a lot about what I mean by that in the coming lessons, but that's an important issue and an extremely pregnant phrase because there is a debate among, and has been a debate among dispensational uh, scholars and writers, pastors and theologians uh, over the past uh, 20 or 30 years as to whether or not dispensationalism is a system of hermeneutics or a system of theology. And you may, I'm telling you this because you may recognize this a few times in the coming conference as you hear the speakers that there may be references to this. The difference is, if it's a system of hermeneutics, then it is a way of interpreting the Bible. If it is a theology, then it is the result of a hermeneutic or a system of interpretation. And what we would say as dispensationalism, as dispensationalists, although there are some who would disagree with us, it is not a system of interpretation. It is a theology. The system of interpretation is one that has been uh, 
understood and at the foundation of Protestant evangelical theology since the Protestant Reformation in 1517, and that is the principle of a literal, plain interpretation of Scripture, that the language of Scripture should be in, understood in its normal, everyday uh, use, normal, everyday language. It is not something special. It is not a special system of interpretation. It is the result of consistently applying a literal interpretation to the Scripture. So that's why I start off with this. It's a theological system which understands that God sovereignly governs the history of the human race through a sequence of divinely directed administrations. Now, for many of you, when you think of dispensations and dispensationalism, the first thing that pops into your mind is God's is a chart of God's plan for the ages. And so for many pew sitters, when they think of the word dispensation, the first thing they think of is a timeline. But time has nothing to do with the term dispensation. The term dispensation from the Greek oikonomia, where we get our word economy, is a word that emphasizes administration, not time. But that administration takes place within a time frame. And so we think of that in terms of a timeline, but time is not part of the lex or part of the semantic meaning of oikonomia. So it is a it has to do with God's governing or administrating human history through a sequence of divinely directed administrations marked by distinctive periods of time as he works out his plan to destroy sin and evil. Now, you won't find that last part in a lot of the definitions of dispensationalism, but it brings in the fact that, that dispensationalism, for many people, usually emphasizes the it's a philosophy of history, that that's part of it. And that's very much a part of what dispensationalism <laughs> provides for us, is an understanding of the meaning and purpose of history. But when you think of the word purpose for history, that means history is going somewhere. Well, where's history going? What is the meaning of history? What is the meaning of our life? Because we often use the term meaning of history and we think in terms of the broad scope, the broad themes of history, but each of our lives is a small part of history. We're just, you and I each make up a different little strand, just a little different current that is in the broad stream of of, of history. So that history is going somewhere. It has a purpose. It has a destiny. And that destiny is God is going to uh, end sin and evil. This relates it ultimately back to, as we'll see in a minute, back to the angels and what we refer to as the angelic conflict or the satanic rebellion or spiritual warfare. There are different terms that are used. And often you have heard that Part of the purpose of human history is to resolve the angelic conflict. I bet not one person here could give me an accurate understanding or definition of what that means to resolve the angelic conflict. That's one of those phrases, sounds good, sounds heavy. I've said it all my life. What does it mean, though? It means that God, that once sin and evil entered into the universe through the fall of Satan, God has to resolve that problem by ultimately ending it and removing it from his creation. So that is the ultimate goal of history is to uh, remove and destroy sin and evil from God's creation. So that's our working definition. It's understanding God's plan and purposes for not just human history, but as human history relates to that broader uh, idea of the angelic conflict. So, what are some distinctives about dispensationalism? Well, first of all, dispensationalism begins with Scripture. Dispensationalism begins with Scripture. Now, that is a very important concept. The starting point, the building block, the foundation for dispensationalism is scripture. 
Now, what I mean by that is that even though other systems of theology, such as covenant theology, which is usually the system that is thought of in contrast to dispensationalism, but there's also other forms of theology. There's there's Lutheran theology, there's Roman Catholic theology, there are other forms that are in many ways closely related to covenant theology, but they're not covenant theology per se, and we'll get into a definition of that a little later on. But there are other theological systems that affirm the infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture. And they too would assert that their starting point is Scripture. But you have, we have to be careful in all areas of life that a lot of people say and claim things that they don't actually do. And these systems do not actually demonstrate uh, 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 that they are consistently built upon Scripture. In fact, what we see in covenant theology and these others is that they have very subtly imported philosophical ideas that they have then imposed or read into the text. That's what's called deductive uh, theology, whereas dispensationalism is inductive. So scripture, dispensationalism begins with a high view of scripture, an extremely high view of scripture. It, we believe that the scripture is, infall- is the infallible, inerrant message uh, from God to the human race. And we're not unique in this. But it is the way we understand that that is important, the way we try to consistently understand and interpret that. So dispensationalism begins with a high view of Scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us that all Scripture is, the translation usually says, given by inspiration, but the Greek word theopneustos means to be breathed out by God. God originated Scripture, which he exhaled, so to speak, and using that imagery of God breathing, God exhales it into the mind of the writer of Scripture who inhales from God and exhales through his writing. God is not dictating Scripture to the writer of Scripture, but he is he is governing the th- thought processes and the writing of the author of script, human author of Scripture in such a way that without voiding or violating the individual volition, personality, writing style, education, background of the individual writer, he guarantees that what the writer of Scripture pens in the original autographs was without error, and therefore it is the very Word of God. We also have a passage like 2 Peter 1, 20 21 that tells us that this is done through the Holy Spirit, that in verse 21, holy men of God spoke in reference to the Old Testament prophets as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The word there for moving is also used of the way wind moves a sailing vessel across the ocean. It's an unseen uh, influence, but it is the determinative influence. So it's God, the Holy Spirit, that directs uh, the writers of Scripture. So we learn that the Word of God is a word from God, not a word about God. But how are we to understand the Bible? How are we to, to understand what God is saying to us? And there are competing views of interpretation. The view that dominated Christianity almost exclusively from about 300 A.D. until 1517 in the Protestant Reformation was a view called allegory. And so there was very little opportunity to develop what we think of as dispensational truth because they weren't looking at the Scripture through the lens of a correct way of interpretation. It was symbolic. It was allegorical. It wasn't literal. It wasn't to be understood in the, according to the rules of normal language. And so the second distinctive of dispensationalism is our uh, view of interpretation. We believe in a consistent in a consistent plain literal interpretation. Other systems will emphasize literal interpretation, but it's not consistent. When it comes to areas of prophecy, areas related to Israel and the church, they suddenly think that terms like Israel and the church have certain allegorical or metaphorical meanings so that Israel does not literally mean Israel. The church does not always literally mean the church, but Israel can mean the church and the church can mean Israel. 
And that's why people become confused, is the language is played with. And once you play with the meaning of words, then you can make anything mean anything, and you lose its, its absolute sense. So we have a, an emphasis on a consistent literal interpretation. This is referred to as the golden rule of interpretation, that when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, take every word at its, <clears throat> at its um, primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning, unless the facts of the immediate context... Okay, so context rules here. When, when, when the Word of God is speaking in a non-literal or symbolic way, it's clear from the passage. The context gives us clues, verbal clues, or uh, contextual clues to tell us that it's not literal. Otherwise, it should be taken literally. Uh, so it should be taken literally unless the facts of the immediate context study in light of related passages and axiomatic and fundamental truths indicate clearly otherwise. In other words, the default is always to a literal normal use of language unless there's a clear, clear uh, reason not to do that. Unfortunately, there are many systems that don't, don't do that. So as we look at... Uh, the scriptures were emphasizing this consistent, plain interpretation. Another thing that we emphasize in dispensationalism is progressive, the progressive nature of revelation, that God only revealed some truth early on to Adam. He revealed more to Noah. He revealed more later on to Abraham. He revealed more to Moses. He revealed more to Isaiah. He revealed more to Zechariah. He revealed more through Jesus Christ and revealed more through the Apostle Paul and revealed things to the Apostle Paul that had never been revealed to others before. And that, and the term that's used in Scripture to describe that is mystery. Not that it's like a whodunit, uh, something you have to figure out, but mystery has the idea of a previously unknown or unrevealed truth. And so we often use the term mystery doctrine of the church age because the church was not prophesied or known in the Old Testament. It came as a result of Israel's rejection of Jesus as the Messiah, and so we refer to the present age as sort of a parenthesis in God's plan before he goes back to his plan uh, for Israel. So as we look at dispensationalism and their understanding of this progress of revelation, there's, it helps us to understand certain distinctives in Scripture, that's a key phrase that you'll hear from dispensationalism is distinguishing different things. Dispensationalists are known for creating lists, for distinguishing certain things from other things in contrast and pointing these things out in Scripture. And here are just uh, some of the things that we have to come to grips with as we look at these distinctives of, uh, of Scripture. Um, first of all, we see that as we look at this, that, script, that Scripture, before I get to that, that dispensationalism develops from an inductive study of Scripture. As part of our understanding of progressive revelation and a literal hermeneutic, we see that our understanding is derived from Scripture inductively rather than deductively. Now, what that means is that we look to Scripture to see what the Bible says. We, we try to avoid reading things into Scripture. Now, over the course of time since dispensationalism has developed um, as, as, a, as a clearly defined system, which has only been since about the 1830s with John Nelson Darby, who was uh, formerly an Anglican uh, pastor, but he uh, separated from the Anglican church, and due to an injury, uh, was put in bed for a while, and while he convalesced, he reread the scriptures over and over again, and as a result of his study of the word, certain things became very clear to him. It wasn't because he read and studied theology, but he went back to the Bible. So dispensationalism from its inception has been a back-to-the-Bible uh, movement. And so rather than imposing certain philosophical ideas upon Scripture, dispensationalism derives from a study of Scripture itself. And so it recognizes this 
progressive nature of God's revelation to man. And so we must interpret Scripture in light of that. That helps us to understand some of these distinctions. For example, early in Jesus' ministry, he told his disciples to only take the gospel to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but not to the Samaritans or the Gentiles in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. But later on, Jesus commanded his disciples to preach the gospel to all creatures. This is seen in Mark sixteen fifteen and Matthew eighteen eighteen through uh, or eighteen to twenty. Or that should be Matthew twenty eight eighteen through twenty. And so, Jesus, why does Jesus make a distinction? Why does he send the disciples to Israel first and then to all people later on? Also, we recognize that at one time, believers were commanded to bring literal animal sacrifices to one particular temple, but no longer do believers bring animal sacrifices uh, to a temple. Why is that different? Is God contradicting himself? At one time, adulterers were to be punished by death, according to Leviticus 20, verse 10, but this is no longer expected in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. In the Old Testament, we read that murderers were to be punished with death, uh, were not to be punished with death at the beginning. When Cain killed Abel, God said, put a mark on him so no one would harm him. And yet later on in the Noahic covenant, God mandates the death penalty for murderers. And this is reaffirmed in the New Testament in Romans 13, 1 through 7. In Leviticus, there is a mandated dietary law, but in Acts chapter 10, those dietary restrictions are removed. Uh, why is this? We understand this because there are differences in the progress of Revelation and that God has different plans and purposes in different periods of history. So this helps us to understand God's plan and purpose. A third thing that we come to understand is that dispensational theology orients us to the entirety of God's plan for all of God's sentient creatures. Now, that term means those that are morally responsible and accountable and who can think and reason. That applies to both angels and to the human race. So dispensational theology orients us to the entirety of God's plan for all of his sentient creatures, both angels and the human race. In contrast, covenant theology says that the purpose uh, God has in history is only redemptive. It narrows the scope to merely redemption, which doesn't include anything about the angels because angels can't be redeemed. There's no redemption solution uh, spoken of in Scripture. This makes a distinction in terms of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism has a broader sense. In fact, uh, a number of years ago, after reading my book on spiritual warfare, a friend said, have you ever noticed that covenant theologians never or rarely talk about spiritual warfare? Well, that's that was true until recently, but... but um, that's because historically in covenant theology, their purpose is only the redemption of mankind. It, they really do tend to ignore everything related to angels. Not that they deny it, they just don't talk about it. It doesn't fit their framework for understanding the Scripture. So in dispensationalism, our understanding of God's plan for the ages begins with his first creation, the angels, and the first failure of creaturely volitional responsibility the fall of Lucifer, which is described in Isaiah fourteen twelve to fourteen and Ezekiel twenty eight twelve to twenty one, in Isaiah fourteen twelve through fourteen, uh, God defines uh, and lists the sins of Satan that he has fallen from heaven because he said in his heart, "I will ascend into heaven." I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Lucifer sinned because he chose to sin, and according to his moral responsibility, he disobeyed God and expressed his desire to be like God. That plunged the angels into, or into a fall. And those angels, approximately a third of them, that followed Satan uh, were part of the angelic rebellion or the angelic revolt, and this established a conflict before the creation of the human race. So our second point is to understand that the fall of Adam 
is directly related to this angelic rebellion. This is seen in Genesis 3, 1 through 7, because it is uh, Satan, Lucifer, now known as Satan, or the devil, who entered into the serpent to tempt Eve first, and then as a result, Adam sinned. So human sin is directly tied to Satan's fall. That connects the two. This is important to understand. The third thing we see in, in Scripture is that the solution to spiritual death, which is salvation of the human race, is connected to the defeat of Satan. This is announced in Genesis 3.15 when God said that he would put enmity between you, that is the serpent or Satan, and the woman, and between your seed, the seed of the serpent, and her seed, the seed of the woman, a reference to the Messiah. So that throughout the Old Testament, the focus of salvation was on the promised redemption through the seed of the woman or the Messiah. And then fourth, we see that the defeat of Satan is directly related to the coming of the Savior. He bruises, uh, the, the Messiah bruises the serpent on the head. It's a, a, a fatal wound. And it's related in about four different ways uh, in the, in the um uh, in the scripture. First of all, we see that Satan tempts the Messiah, who is referred to as the seed of the woman. This is at the beginning of our Lord's public ministry. Second, we see that Satan is instrumental in the arrest and crucifixion of the Messiah. It is Satan who personally indwells Judas Iscariot and and tempts him to betray the Lord Jesus Christ, which he does, and it is that betrayal that leads to his arrest and his crucifixion. A third thing we see in Satan's involvement in the death of Christ is that the final victory of our Lord at his return in the future, leads to the defeat, the final defeat and incarceration of the devil and his angels, the demons. Now, this is brought out in a couple of different passages. Usually we go to uh, Revelation for this, but I ran across a passage in Isaiah this last week that I probably read I don't know how many times and suddenly realized this is talking about the incarceration of the demons and Satan during the millennial kingdom. Uh, this is the earlier part of this context talks about the judgment in end times known as the day of the Lord, concluding with the statement in verse 19 that the earth is violently broken, the earth is split open, the earth is shaken exceedingly. This is a description of those judgments that occur uh, surrounding the day of the Lord at the end of the tribulation. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a hut. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it, and it will fall and not rise again. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of exalted ones. See, that's not talking about the judgment on mankind. That's talking about the judgment of the host of heaven, the demons. The term host of heaven often refers to the angelic, always refers to the angelic host, the angelic armies, and this is a description of the fallen angels. Uh, he will punish on high the host of exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and they will be shut up in the prison. After many days they will be punished. So the many days refers to the millennial kingdom. They're prisoned first, and then they are, what we learn from Revelation 20 is then they're released, and then they're judged and cast into the lake of fire. Um, concluding in Isaiah 24, then the moon will be disgraced, the sun is shame, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. So this connects it to a millennial fulfillment. In Revelation 20, 1 through 3, we read that uh, Satan is going to be uh, chained in the bottomless pit. That goes right back to the Isaiah 24 passage. And uh, verse twenty, uh, verse two, chapter twenty, verse two, we read that the angel will lay hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and cast him in the bottomless pit, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years are finished. And after these things, he must be released for a little while, and then he will be cast into the lake of fire. 
So we see that the death of Satan is directly related to the coming of the Savior. And in this last fourth way, we see that at the cross, sin and evil are defeated as Christ pays the penalty for sin, reveals the, uh, the love of God, the unconditional love of God for all, all mankind in its, uh, in its greatest way at the cross with the provision of salvation. So from all of this, we learn that, that dispensationalism helps us to understand God's plan and purpose for history and the role that salvation plays ultimately within the broader scope of the angelic rebellion. This is also brought out in passages like Revelation chapter 12, which describes the in, in a panoramic way uh, the role of Satan and the angels in not only the assault on on the child that's born in verse 3, that is born to the woman who later flees into the wilderness, and that's Israel. So it also explains anti-Semitism and the hostility uh, in history to the Jewish people. Now finally, as we as we uh, look at dispensational theology, we recognize that it provides a framework for understanding the meaning of life, suffering, and history. Just very briefly, the meaning of life is to serve God and to glorify Him. Part of this is seen in Genesis 1.28, where we are created to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth and subdue it, and to have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And in Genesis 2.15, we read that the Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. We were created to serve God and to glorify Him. Because of sin, suffering enters into the world. So dispensational theology helps us to understand the meaning of suffering. The very first book written in the Old Testament was not Genesis. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, were penned by Moses approximately between 1446 and 14, for, uh, about 1406 B.C. during the time of the wilderness wanderings. But the first book written in the Old Testament was the book of Job. What does the book of Job deal with? It deals with suffering. And who causes this, this undeserved suffering on Job? It's Satan. We see this in, Je- in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2. So the first book that God has written, the first book of Scripture that God reveals, is a book to explain to the human race why there is suffering, undeserved suffering, in human history. And it is related directly to Satan and to the angelic conflict. So with dispensationalism, we also can come to a better understanding of the meaning of suffering in history as it connects to the angels and as it connects to God's plan and purposes in history. And that's the third area of explanation we get, is that dispensationalism provides us with a meaning for history, that history has a direction and a purpose. Its direction is positive. The reason I say that is because critics of dispensationalism uh, which holds to premillennialism, o- often sarcastically refers to us as pessimillennialists. We're pessimistic because we see that human history will lead to the tribulation. But we don't stop with the tribulation. The tribulation ends with the return of Christ to establish his kingdom on the earth and ultimately to completely vanquish evil and sin and to remove it from all human history, and God will then create a new heavens and a new earth. So dispensationalism is ultimately positive. And it is positive because ultimately God provides a solution. It begins, the solution begins at the cross. And so for every individual, there is a responsibility in terms of dealing with sin and evil in their own personal life, and that is to look to the cross to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior in that he went to the cross to pay the penalty for sin, to die on the cross as our substitute so that the penalty of sin, spiritual death, would be paid for. And once again, the issue comes back to individual volition and individual responsibility for it is up to us to make the decision to accept him or reject him. John chapter 1 verse 12 says that as many as received him to them gave he the power 
to be called the sons of God, or the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. And in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we read, For by grace you have been saved through faith. That faith is a personal exercise of your volition to trust in Christ. Uh, that faith is not of your, uh, that salvation through faith is not of yourselves. That salvation through faith is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The issue is our personal responsibility for, before God to accept Christ as our personal Savior, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to uh, look at this important uh, teaching of Scripture that we refer to as the theology of dispensationalism, that we've derived it from Scripture, a study of your Word, that you have revealed these things to us, that you work in different ways in different uh, periods of time, all leading up to a final resolution of the, of the uh, presence of sin and evil in the universe. And Father, we pray for this congregation, for those that are here today, that if there's anyone here who's never resolved this problem in their own life, that this is their opportunity to do so, the opportunity to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Jesus died on the cross for you. He paid the penalty for your sins. He made it possible for you to have eternal life. But first you must trust in him and him alone. Scripture says there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only way. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, Father, we pray that you would challenge us with what we have studied today and that this may provide a foundation for us as we go forward to understand your plans and your purposes for history as revealed in your word. And we pray this in Christ's name.